the One Two Football Podcast. The voices of tomorrow here today. Right, welcome back to the One Two Football Podcast. Been game week one. A lot can change in three months, but unfortunately for Oli, not a lot has. So I think he's got a lot to say about the Manchester United performance that we saw against Brighton, where unfortunately they, well, fortunately, depending on who you support, they lost 2-1. Oli, um, yeah. I'm going to let you take it away because I, <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I've, I've got a lot to say. Only some of it's about the performance, but a lot of it's just about Manchester United in whole, really. I mean, there's not much more we can say about the performance. That's not only already been said, but just look back at last year, every single thing, it's just a clone. It's a, It's... You can copy and paste every single match basically from last year and we have the exact same one this season, which I don't think we were expecting. If we went up pre-season, I know you can't base it up pre-season, but, you know, as always, Man United let us down. We normally have a good pre-season, to be fair. If pre-season was the Premier League, we'd be title winners every single time because we do well then, but not the same against Brighton, was it? It was, I mean, progress from last game last season against them. You know, we got absolutely things. So that's progress if you want to look at it that way. But in terms of performance, nah. I mean, first of all, I like Ten Hag. Uh, I'm going, uh, to fair, when he first came in, I was really excited about him. Certain things have now put me off and I'll get to them. But it's one thing that's put me off a bit is his thinking behind the formation and sort of the striking position up front. Why he started Ericsson up top, I don't know. You know, maybe the obvious, more obvious one would have that if you're going to do that would have been Bruno, maybe more of an out and out person up there. But he's failed when he's been there before. We tried this without a striker under several managers before Ten Hag. And it was the same outcome. Loss, 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 defeat. It doesn't work with anyone up there that isn't meant to be up there. And granted, Martial was out injured. Ronaldo, though, had as much game time, I think, maybe 15 minutes less than Ericsson. And still Ericsson started. So when you're in that position, yeah, OK, you can be like, he's, you know, all this situation around, is he going to go? Is he going to stay? You know, I think Ten Hag wanted to get a point across. You're not in charge. But that could have cost us points. Now, yeah, I'm not the biggest advocate for Ronaldo right now. I do think we would be better off without him when we have someone in that position like Martial back fit to play there because I don't think the system, the pressing and stuff like that that Ten Hag wants us to do fits Ronaldo. But I've got, I, I was going to come to Ronaldo later on to that, but I'm just going to jump into my points now. Cristiano Ronaldo, it's a, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, been listening to a lot of journalists, been reading a lot as well. And he's been staying behind after training for extra su- uh, shooting sessions. He's been one of the most impressed, Ten has been most impressed by Ronaldo out of a lot of the players. And a lot of people are saying he's acting like a player that doesn't look like he's leaving Manchester United. If you want to leave Man United, you're not doing extra training sessions at the end of this, are you? You're, you're going as soon as you can, you're going. I mean, like when he left the match halfway that time, you expect similar thing for training. So I think what a lot of people are saying is, and what a lot of people are taking from this is the fact that he knows he's not going anywhere. Nobody wants him. Man United don't want to let him go. So I think he's in the mindset now that he's like, okay, I'm staying at Man United. I've got him, you know, impress this manager. Um, and the training sessions are apparently 10 times better million times better they couldn't get much worse but they're a lot better than what they were last season so I think he's aware of that so he's clearly maybe you know getting maybe I can stay at Man United maybe they're going to do better than I expect hopefully we do Brighton wasn't a good indication of that but yeah so uh, what do you guys before I move on to anything else Man United what do you guys think do you guys watch the match what do you think of the whole Man United situation (laughs) like I said there isn't much to say on it really they were just dreadful not much had changed. That, that's what I, I, I sort of gathered. It was, it was you play the same midfield, McFred doesn't work. Don't know why I keep trying it, but you know they, they, they seem to have a loyalty. Maybe one day that they'll realise that you actually need to buy a defensive midfielder. But until they don't, it's going to be the same problem again and again and again. Um, they looked really, I mean, Maguire was poor, had the same problems with De Gea, just the set, all the same problems. It was like, again, nothing changed. It, you know, it was. It, you know, towards the end it got better, but you know, you, you would you'd have to expect that. You know, you're trying to get a game. I thought they were almost gonna get back into it. You know, you sort of typical Man United, they didn't play so well, but they were gonna get back into it. But it didn't happen. And to be fair, Brighton should have had more. They were denied a very obvious penalty. I had no idea why why that happened. I'm not worried for Martinez because he's gonna get time to adjust. Um and I'm not gonna be like he's the worst player I've ever seen. You, you know, he didn't play particularly well, but he wasn't awful. But I do worry for him against big strikers. I, I do, you know, naturally, I think I, I'm not sure how that's going to go. But Brighton were excellent. They, they do deserve a lot of credit. Um, Brighton were excellent. They're, they're, some people might have been worried about Brighton because they, they lost a few of their players. Basum, obviously, one of their most influential players. But I thought Lalana and Welbeck were sort of almost roll back the years. You, you can't really rely on them 
being fit for a whole season, but Lalana was excellent. Welbeck was really good. Um, it always seems to save a good performance for Man United. So fair play to Brighton. Graham Potter tactically won the battle against Ten Hag um, on Sunday. And that's interesting, to be fair, because watching the match, the commentators and to be fair, I was at first thinking Potter could have got this really badly wrong here. They're basically playing three at the back and what they thought would be wing backs were actually playing basically as wingers. And for the first five, ten minutes, Brighton were a bit on edge, I'd fair. I was watching, I was thinking, you know what? Bit not as quick a pass as I was expecting, but Man United, you know, this is okay. Uh, and then it all went downhill, really. And, you know, Potter did get it bang on with his tactics. Um, but like you were saying then, CDM, I think Martinez, you know, I think if we don't sign anyone in midfield, I'd love to give him a chance in CDM. You know, you don't have to be the biggest of players to play there. You just need to be able to get a foot in, win a ball. And so like Kante is a great example of that. Not got the hype, but he's a great ball winner. So maybe, you know, if Varane's fit, then we can play Varane and someone at the back. And then Martinez just in front in CDM. It's not the solution we want, but maybe it's the solution we need currently. Um, talking about transfers quickly, though. Ten Hag, when he came in, I was excited by it. You know, De Jong, Anthony, you know, Timber, what I was expecting. All these players. I was like, yeah, okay. He knows he plays. It's exciting. Now it's getting ridiculous. Okay. Now I'm I'm annoyed by him. Now you're looking at players. Who did I coach 10 years ago? And now to Oh, let's bring him in. No, no, no. Okay. We're not now. We're not now. But we're only not now because former players, okay, it's now released. Former players contacted Man United and said, yo, this guy's a racist or racist. Okay. I'm not saying he's a racist. I'm not saying that. Don't want to get that sued or anything. Allegedly. But allegedly. Allegedly, that's, that's the word. Allegedly a racist. Okay. And so they pulled it out because of fan backlash, but also <clears> the former <throat> players. You know, you're in a pickle when, the, when they actually did want him, but it was because fans and former players spoke up to get in that. Um, yeah. And then, and then Rabio. These aren't signings which Man United need to be making. These, and also, we've had a lot of arguments in the past, and a lot of people have said a lot of things in the past that the board haven't backed uh, Man United managers. You know, Jose wasn't bad, Oli wasn't bad, this and that. Even though they spent a lot of money, they weren't necessarily backed to play as they want. Now it's gone the other end of it. Backing the manager, I don't think necessarily means signing the players that just he wants. Because right now it's a very short-term vision. If Ten Hag doesn't work out, the next manager's coming in with a load of Dutch players that he doesn't want, and the same thing happens again. I think backing the manager needs to be all about, you know, providing them with the tools to succeed both on and off the pitch. That means, you know, top quality scouts, top quality coaches, top quality players, good manager, good physios, all of this needs to be in it. And when you look at other teams, you know, the best teams in the Premier League, best teams in the world, Liverpool, Man, uh, Man City, not Man United, that's completely <laughs> opposite what I'm saying, Man City, Look at the setup that they've got. Yeah, okay, the managers have a say in what they what they get in scouting, but they have scouts that get a list of players, show them to the managers, and then they say because a lot of people were there like, oh, you know, Ten Hag's doing the right thing. You know, he's saying what he wants. This is what Klopp and stuff does. No, it isn't. Klopp didn't even want uh, Salah. Klopp wanted Julian, Br uh, whatever his name is, Brand or whatever. But then the top scout said, no, no, Salah. The same with Mane. I think he wanted like Mario Götze or something. And then they got Mane and Salah. So the way that we're doing it now is complete. Other. We weren't giving the manager who we wanted with players like Oli, stuff like that. And now we're giving the manager too much control over the scouting players. Because I'm actually confused. Do we have scouts at Man United? Because right now the manager's being a scout and he's not a scout. He's a tactical genius, really, that he's shown in his previous things. Let him do the stuff on the pitch. Say, look, these are six players we've got in the midfield, which we should have done right at the start of the transfer window. Do you like these six midfielders? Rank them in the list that you think that we can get them and we'll try them one by one let him pick from a selection not pick from the entire world because as we're seeing his knowledge only really goes to the Dutch league and right now that's given us players like an Outovic not an Outovic now but was an Outovic so I think it's just all going wrong and I think until we do that any manager can come in Pep, Klopp might do slight improvements but no one can win the title no one can really drastically improve Manchester United here until the club right down to the core is actually changed and whether that's with the Glazers or not I know they're doing a massive um, thing when it's Liverpool match they're like emptying the stadium um, so that'll be interesting to see it'll just give Liverpool another advantage but I completely back it if we can get Glazers out Glazers out I mean I think we're two billion pounds in debt since they took over they took out a 600 million pound loan and they haven't paid a single penny of it off and now they're putting it on Man United as a club to pay back these guys just want money and it's just ridiculous. But yeah, like I said, that was a quick little thing on Man United. But personally, I don't think any manager can succeed. I think Ted Hart could do better than, you know, obviously better than Ralph. Ralph was terrible in that position. He should never have got there. Better than Oli, probably because he's better tactically. But no manager's ever going to blow us away and live up to the expectation that us as fans want because we haven't got the infrastructure 
to back the manager. No manager's going to be great if he's the person picking the scouts because it's like uh, Tuchel at the minute, you know, he's spending half of his time. He looks absolutely knackered. He's spending half his time scouting as well. And look how that's gone. So the two big boys in the Premier League, which are using their managers to seek out transfers, have a terrible windows in terms of failures to get players. So I don't think it's any... Uh, I don't think it's that weird that, you know, both of these teams haven't necessarily lived up to expectations on the first game of the season. Yeah, there's my ramble. I'm fuming. Look, I'm red in the face. I'm normally red in the face anyway, <laughs> but I'm even redder. <laughs> Kieran, just quickly, how are you feeling about United's business? Do you feel it's like the manager's fault? I don't, I don't think it is. I, I, I think, like, I've... Rather than, like, chipping in while you guys have talked, I've, like, thought about trying to raise different points. And I think, like... This, this summer has highlighted the classic United of recent years of panic mode when it comes to transfers. It's it's like quite astounding when you look, when you think about how similar the Sancho situation is to De Jong, you know, minus the whatever the hell is going on at Barcelona. Um, but it, it's the classic chasing this player that's highly rated the entire summer and then not getting him because, I mean, that's where it looks like it's going. And you think about the money spent on certain players. The, the Alex Tellez deal at the time seemed like a steal, but, I mean, he's been shipped off the following season on loan. £80 million for Maguire, 50 for wan -Bissaka. You know, both players who really aren't good enough at that level. No holding midfielder. It's just, it's a it's a consistent web of inconsistency in the market. And then, amazingly, it's just the, the narrow-mindedness and naivety of it, of seeing it not work on the pitch and then still not bringing in people that you need. The Cavani signing at the time, people were a bit like, really? He's, what, 33, 34? He didn't have a club. They didn't know his levels of fitness. And he was injured a lot. When he played, he was very good. He was a goal scorer, which was perfect. But when you think about it in the short term, yeah, it was a good idea. But long term, you know it's not going to last. And you've got to think about all these deals that are getting done. And they're just not really working out. I mean, even possibly Ericsson. There's no guarantee that he's going to thrive in a United shirt because I think maybe him and Bruno are so similar. So it's going to be a challenge of one might be getting shunted out to the wing. And yeah, that may have happened kind of in his Spurs group, but that's when he had the beauty of Deli Alley playing as a second striker. So it allowed Ericsson to play in that deeper role, but he was the furthest player forward for United at the weekend, at least at the start. So it, again, it just seems like a, all oh, this player has become available in the market, might be able to get him on the cheap. In this case, it was on a free. So I think it's just it's it's the wrong people at the top making these decisions and not really thinking them through because you know Ericsson's not getting any younger either. Um, you'd argue is is best years are potentially behind him. Um, so I think really it's 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 not one of those as we've probably said so many times and as Ollie probably knows it's not one of those things that is going to be fixed in the short term when you bring in someone like Ten Hag who's a proven tactical genius really with what he did with Ajax. Um, but there's just so much corrosion at that club and it's going to take years, years, possibly even a decade, I think. And okay. I think as well, you need to stop thinking about about okay. the, uh, the glory days of the past. And so Alex and because it, it was it's coming up to nearly a decade ago now, like it's in the past. Move on from it. Stop talking about, oh, I, I remember when United were this. I remember when United were that. It doesn't matter right now. Like, literally means nothing. City are light years ahead. Um, and that's what you've got to do. You've got to live in the now. And maybe sometimes United take that into their transfer policy and you think, oh, yeah, let's do it in the now and sign players that are nearing their 30s and not necessarily in their primes. And you just think, when will it end? But I mean, I just, that's, that's the thing, though, what you're saying. It was right, it's right at the top of the club, but now it's also right at the, the you know, at the forefront of the club and the fact that at this, this transfer window has also got the complete wrong look at it. Like I said, they're giving the man, manager the complete reins, which in the long run, also, if he's not a big success, is not going to help us because we're going to be left with, you know, players that the next manager wants to offload. So we're just going around in circles. Um, but yeah, I think we're signing... This is the, what... We've signed like someone over the age of thirty, nearly every transfer window for the, like the past yeah. like. Two well, I mean, on football years. manager, that's what I did. <laughs> so did I last time, but it's different when you were. Uh, United, United age. look how United look how I look on career mode like three seasons yeah. into like a mid-table prem club when I'm looking at free agents yeah. who are like thirty yeah. <laughs> who I could like snip up for a couple of years just to improve my team. That's kind of how it, how it comes across. Someone that's said what... the United squad with Rabiot and Arnautovic looks like an SBC. <laughs> it's such a mishmash. <laughs> 
a mishmash of players is, is ridiculous. Rabio, Rabio's not. You can't be an awful footballer and play for PSG and Juventus. I don't believe that for a second. But one thing Rabio doesn't bring is he's, he's not on form for Juve, no matter his achievements. And he brings a lot of baggage. He's not. He's not going to help what is an already top toxic dressing room. His mum is be famously. Fair. Yeah, a horrible to be agent. fair, you say a toxic dressing room. We've just got rid of most of the toxics. Like, the panel dressing is really good right now. We've got rid of toxic players, Lingard, Pogba, all this. And we're going to bring in someone that's toxic and got a toxic mum. So I don't think we it need is. this. Imagine it's a the only good thing is, is that 50% of the toxic that we thought we were bringing in, being uh, an out of it, isn't coming in now. But if we brought yeah. both of them players in, oh, it would be terrible. To absolutely terrible. The only good thing I can think of Rabio is we do need depth in the midfield. And you know, I like, I, I was a big fan of McTominay a season and a half ago. I'm going off him. I can't lie. I still think Fred's, you know, a, a was, decent player. He was player. a good Jordan Henderson. Yeah, he was. He was. I was to like, be fair, I mean, they played, I mean, played about the same on Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Both played to be fair, with Fred, I still think Fred's getting better. To be fair, it wasn't a great game against Brighton. I do think he's been getting better over the years. And I do think in his, if he played in a box to box position role with the CDM person next to him, he Fred would, would be do decent. good in a pivot with someone who could be a. Exactly. Exactly. He would be good. But that's what I'm saying. Rabio, you know, yeah, it's not a signing we want, but at the end of the day, if we sign nobody else in the transfer window, if they've got no, if they're not aiming to sign anyone else, I will, I don't want Rabio, but I will have to take him because he's, he probably is a slight improvement on what we've already got, but it's not what he's we've not, got. He's not as good as what there. I saw his passing stats. He's not, he's not much. No, oh yeah, no, his stats, there. his stats are terrible, but we can't get much worth with the mid state of the midfield. Uh, but yeah, again, sure. again, I would rather give it to a youngster than signing someone that's toxic. What about James Garner? Gonna... Yeah, James Garner, man, so good for Forest last year. Yeah, uh, him. he's out on loan again, isn't he? He's going to, which makes yeah. it's such a confusing move. I feel that's such like yeah, a confusing keep, move. Yeah, he's probably better than McTominay. That's like, what's he's, he's given him a chance. That's what confuses me with Ten Hag, though. It's literally been less than seven days since he said, if we can't get our main targets, we're going to mould players already at the club into the players that I want. Now, he's clearly done play, seen the Brighton performance. And like I've said, he's in charge of transfers this summer. And he's clearly gone, crap. Uh, we let's go sign someone because he's completely gone against what he's been saying for the entire transfer window, which is why I'm a bit annoyed about Ten Hagens. Like I've said, I don't want him to be in charge of transfers. It's just getting ridiculous now. At the start, it was looking good, but now we need to actually get scouts in and stuff like that. So that's why I don't think we can just blame the board for this poor transfer window. I think we also need to blame Ten Hag slightly. And I know that might, people might say it's a bit unfair, but it's not. Look who clearly he's in charge of these transfers and no one can say otherwise because look at the players we're trying to get. They're all known by Ten Hag. So, but anyway, you guys um, had a slot. Well, at, Kieran had a better, uh, better weekend. Uh, Liverpool, not so much. But um, we'll move on from Man United. We'll move on. There's been a lot said. Well, while it was a rather depressing weekend for Ollie, I had a lot of fun post like quarter past three because I was a bit, I was a bit shaky when War Prowse scored. Um, but you know, I had faith because I thought plenty of time. We'll come back. And we did uh, quite comfortably as well. Beat Southampton 4-1, top of the league after the first game week. End the season now because we've got Chelsea next. And I'm a little bit less optimistic about that. But still optimistic because I think the group we've assembled is top tier. Um, and the fact as well that no new signing started just kind of shows. And we still, the depth we had as well on the bench, you know, when you've got players like Basuma on the bench, you can bring on to stabilise a game. Oliver Skip still coming back as well. He's arguably the fourth choice midfielder, and I'd say like is a future captain at Spurs, which is just very exciting. Uh, Richarlison obviously back as well because he was suspended. Um, that iconic flair image um, missed the first game as well. So yeah, Stamford Bridge, tough place to go, not ideal, but if we're going to beat them at any moment, I, I fancy us. I fancy us. This weekend, yeah. I wonder oh, what yeah. your guys thought. So I was neutrals. I think I, I think I, I yeah. predicted two one. Sorry, Nathan, I've just bought you right <laughs> in there. I think uh, I'll just go. I said I've probably got less to say on this topic. Um, um, yeah, no, I predicted. I think Tottenham to win two one. Is it on Super Six? If it's not, then yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. yeah, two one then two one. I think I put Spurs to win. Although I can't really see Chelsea scoring. I mean, I didn't watch it, the yeah. I didn't watch the Everton Chelsea game, but neither team had a striker on the pitch, so that's why and there was so inspiring. little goals. Exactly. Penalty won it. 
And I mean, yeah. from what I've heard, I, I mean, Kula Bali was supposed to be not slow, slow, but it was meant to be all right pace with uh, centre back. But I mean, apparently Thiago and him were really slow. So if you can get Son running in the behind them, you could absolutely smash him. To be honest, and I mean, four one against Southampton does my uh, you know last weekend's um, prediction. Yeah, yeah, that helps me. Has some little sight to Southampton down, and also I said Fulham would do okay as well. And you know, let's go. Uh, so yeah, it's been one game last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just said stop the count. <laughs> Yeah, one game point. as well. Uh, yeah, no. So I think I think Tottenham could have a really good go. I mean, uh, Kulovsky really excites me. Wish I had him in my FPL. Um, but yeah, a four-one and Harry Kane didn't score. I mean, that's showing that yeah, the, also that's, that's yeah. Is that, is, I mean, I mean, Kane should have scored. Son should have laid that ball off to him um, and could have been five-one. But I mean, I think that shows you how you did good, but you could do even better if you had Son and Kane hitting the target. Like that could have easily been a typical Southampton nine-nil. Um, so. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think you will win. Um, I think Chelsea do need a striker. And also, I think they just need to settle in. They've got, you know, a new-looking squad in a way. So, it just takes time. Yeah, I think if you're going to beat Chelsea, you probably do beat them next weekend. I, 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 I'm not that confident in Chelsea, confident enough to put them fourth. But I, while I didn't put it, I had two showers a shout to be the first manager sack. So, I, I, I'm not entirely confident in Chelsea. That game didn't inspire a lot. In terms of Koulibaly's debut, I mean, I remember Thiago Silva's Premier League debut where... Callum Robinson taught him a new one. And <laughs> yeah. So I, you can't take too much from it. It's because Thiago Silva established himself. I think it's just a case of getting used to it, getting used to the pace. It's a, it's a lot different in, in the in Syria than it is the Premier League. Um, but yeah, the, the, the game was not memorable. Everton looked okay, you know, because they had no striker either. The sort of only thing memorable from it was Raheem Sterling's arch. Um, aside from that, <laughs> there was absolutely nothing. So I think Spurs will win. I'm, I'm really excited about Spurs. I think um, Kudelski is, is fantastic. I think that that could be the, one of the best front threes in the Premier League and a league that does not lack them. Um, and yeah, just really exciting for Spurs. Conte, and we talk about people backing the manager, it's clear that Lee Levy's had a change of, of tone when it comes to backing the manager because he is all in on Conte and I think he realises that this is it. This is the moment where you've got Harry Kane in his this prime. This is what he should have done a few years ago with Bob. <laughs> you've got I... Son in his prime. This is the moment you have to capitalise on it and you need to win a trophy. Let's go all in with what the manager's saying. So I'm excited. I don't think Spurs will win the league when I say that, but I think Spurs <laughs> are going to be very competitive in terms of cups. And they're definitely, I don't think they're going to be a million miles away from Liverpool and Man City in, in can, the league. Can I quickly hop in before Kira goes off of one? Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, you mentioned it could be one of the best front three. I think from the Sky Sports stat that I saw, I could be wrong, but it's not very far off, even if I am wrong, that since Kulaveski was has signed, he's been third in the rankings for most goal involvements. And the only two players above him were Son and Kane. So I think that top three, all three of them are in the top three for most goal involvements mm. since Kulaveski. So it's got, it is the best attack in the Premier League. The in terms of stats, yeah, so. most efficient. Well, you, you mentioned that as well. Uh, I saw something, I don't know if it was since Conte's come in or since the start of the year, um, but we scored the most goals in the Premier League. And that's ahead of teams like City and Liverpool who put five and six past certain teams when they, when they play at home. So, I mean, that, that just goes to show how clinical we are in front of goal. Um, I think when it comes to the game, the, the biggest battle for me is going to be in, in the wing-backs. Um, Chelsea looked so good at the start of last season when both James and Chilwell were fit. Um, obviously, them both getting injured at awkward times, it derailed their momentum massively. Um, but the, the, the most impressive thing, actually, for me was how good Sesame and Emerson were. Arguably, at the start of the season, if you'd said to me, who would be the first choice wing-backs? I'd say, before Matt Doherty got injured against Aston Villa, he was he was looking like the, the Wolves version of Doherty. Um, and then you bring in a Champions League winner, Ivan Perisic as well. You'd think they'd be the first two um, selected, but it was lack of fitness meant it was Sesame and Emerson. Both of them contributed massively to the win, getting on the end of, of crosses, getting high up, pushing... Southampton's fullbacks back. So I think that's going to be so crucial. Um, if we can really pen in Chelsea's back five, put them under pressure, you know, that that's arguably where the biggest duel is going to be with, with it being what Sestinovi, Rhys James and, and Emerson uh, up against Chilwell. I'm assuming that I, I wouldn't change anything because I imagine Perisic and Doherty are still building up fitness. Um, so I think that's kind of where the game's probably won or lost. Of course, the midfield is massively important. I think when you're away from home at Stamford Bridge, I think scoring first, is massively important. Um, we can get Kane and Son up and running as well because I think both of them are, I don't want to call them confidence players because they can just produce a moment out of nothing. But when they're both on form, um, they're basically unstoppable. This time, 
a few seasons ago, it was the second game against Southampton where Kane and Son were just absolutely lethal. Um, so I think, I think if I'm honest, I think if we do beat them, I think we might beat them. Like, yeah, couple by a couple of goals. I, I, I that's genuinely how much I believe. I feel like once we score, like, there's almost kind of no stopping it. Like I remember last season at games against Wolves and Southampton when we went down a couple of goals and we didn't pull one back. It was difficult to even come back into the game. We lost both games. The Southampton game and the Newcastle game, we concede early, but we equalise early. So there's no like worrying when it gets to 20, 30 minutes to go and you're panicking because you haven't even scored yet. And then from there, confidence just grows and grows and grows. And that's why you end up hitting four or five. So I think if we do score early and that confidence is flowing, I see no reason why we can't put three or four past them. I'm genuinely that confident. I, I just thought, and I mean, I could be completely wrong to do, um, correct me if I am, but one of the good things when you have wing backs like James and Chilwell is their crossing ability. La- Ma- oh, not Man City, one about Chelsea have, you know, Mount and Havertz and sort of that and Sterling and them attacking areas, neither of which are very tall. So, you know, you can talk about, you know, and last year, I know Lukaku wasn't really on form, but there was a bit of a target man in there. If they're whipping in these balls, they're not really much of an aerial threat and yeah. they haven't really got a goal scorer either. So I think they really will be lacking in sort of that. But I mean, so I think, you know, James and Chilwell, great wing backs. Um, and, you know, I imagine they'll do decent this season, but maybe they won't do as well. Um, because, you know, they haven't really got that target person in there. So imagine, I've just fair, imagine if they did sign someone like Lukaku that was actually on form, they'd be probably getting mad amount of assists. But I just thought that, I just, I thought it was an interesting point, you know, yeah. they haven't really got anyone to hit. I suppose, but then Trent managed to do it with, with Salah, uh, Mane mm. and uh, uh, Firmino and Jota. I mean, Jota, the, the thing is with those players is they're goal scorers. So is, what you say about Chelsea is, is kind of right because they don't have goal scores. Sterling scores a lot of goals in a team that scores a lot of goals. And I do think he quite suits the, the way Chelsea play, but it, I, I, I do feel like they need someone else as well. But I, I don't know who who that's to be. I, I don't know who. See, Werner's just left. I mean, it's not like it wasn't, he wasn't going to be him, but I, I don't know who is going to be that guy. Havertz is, is always a decent threat in, in those positions. But yeah, they, they do lack a striker, I think. James, James, I think Kieran might have said it. Was like, James might be their top goal scorer this season if it all all sort of bows well because he he is their probably their best striker of the ball. So yeah. I, it, 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 well, that, that's the thing as well is with wing backs is you have another player that you flood into the box. So then it's it's essentially if you're playing with a front three and you've got one wing back looking for another at the back post, it, it's you, you're likely to be outnumbered if you're the defensive team. That's how we saw. Um, Spurs' equaliser was setting on getting it at the back post, putting Carl Walker Peters under pressure because all the other centre backs were kind of occupied. So Walker Peters has to tuck in with them, which allows for then a wing back to come around the back. And I think that's going to be a, a really important route to goal for us this season. Um, so I, I think it's going to be about who makes those back post runs, if anything, from those deep crosses because there's no one really, I, I, from Spurs' point of view, I mean, I think Harry Kane should score a lot more headers, personally, when you, when you consider his aerial dominance. But, I mean, he's, he's a lethal finisher, so anything along the ground, any second balls, anything that bounces, it, it's likely to be put away. But I, I think having that added impetus of another player coming in around the back is going to be a massive weapon for us this season, as we saw with Chelsea last season, the way they stretched teams and allowed for that player bursting in, making a, a gut-busting run and scoring. James's goal against Arsenal right at the start of last season was one thing. They, they turned Arsenal's defence, meaning that I, I think it was Tierney at the time, or Tavares, having to tuck in and allows that space for the wing-back who, you know, really, in a set formation, you consider him as part of the defensive line. But when they actually go forward, it's an extra man you need to worry about. We saw it with um, Brighton's goal, uh, Gross's first goal, Luke Shaw having to tuck in because centre-backs are getting dragged out. So he takes the main target maybe the cross is going for which then allows for someone like a wing-back to come in, it's basically an easy goal. So I think that's why Chelsea's full-back numbers were so high and also why Alexander-Arnold Robertson's numbers were so high because they just flood the box. So it's more chaos and more carnage. It allows for them to get on the end of crosses, to win second balls, to set up teammates. So I think it'll be a massive, massive weapon um, for Spurs this season. I hope yeah, we that's talk well. about. 
Sorry. <laughs> it's not on the it's not, we're just all I want to hop in one little thing one little thing one is really one little thing um and i think he is quite small as well so he's a little bit of a little thing um i hope that uh brozier or whatever doesn't just get lost now at chelsea because he had a really good oh, i don't know I, I, he looks small to me <laughs> um, no. so i'm gonna say he's small he might not be small well if they're not get him on the end of the crosses yeah. um but i hope he doesn't just go i hope he doesn't like get lost he had a really good season last season and i think he definitely probably would have done better and i bet you he wanted to go out on loan but they have no strike I hope they give him a chance if they don't bring anyone in. Anyway, to you, Nathan, whatever you well, want Yeah, to we were talking about, talking about big strikers. I mean, I don't really want to talk too much about the Liverpool game because quite a lot has been said. Fulham were absolutely excellent. Pressed us. Paulinho looks like a really great signing. The only real two positives, Harvey Elliott, of course. Um, he was excellent against his old club. But the, the big man I want to talk about, Darwin Nunes, I only want to talk about briefly because he was just so electric when he came on up. I already love him. He's a, he's a player that you don't know what's going to happen when he gets the ball. Will he touch it out? I don't think he knows what's going to happen. <laughs> but that's probably the beauty of it. Will also, can I just down? say, I'm pretty sure it's actually Nunez. It's not Nunez. So, um, yeah. Nunez, there you go. Get, get it. Well, that's me. I was going to yeah. say, I, was gonna say I, I, never, I never get a name wrong. What can I say? <laughs> well, Nunez, I'll take your word for it. Nunez was absolutely, he changed the game for us going forward, at least when he came on against Fulham. We looked awful. Completely off the pace. Fulham really rattled us, won the midfield battle. Mitrovic was excellent, really sending out a statement that he can play in the Premier League. I think if he, if he can get far in Fulham, we'll definitely stay up. There, there's no words about it. Obviously, my concern was that that wouldn't happen, but I could be wrong. Obviously, only one game. We'll see how he fares, fares in the next one. But, I mean, we Nunes just... I think he's got to start Monday against Palace. He looked absolutely brilliant when he came on. He, he had something. And he just... He's up. He's a striker, which we which you haven't really had for for a while. He just plays up front, and I know that sounds very basic, but he's someone that when we've got players, I know Thiago's out injured, which is going to be a shame, which is a big shame. But you can just imagine the sort of passes that will come through there. Someone like Harvey Elliott who creates a lot of space in replacement for Thiago, that's going to be excellent. That also frees up Salah because Nunes is di- directly of you making defenders move. So I, I feel like I feel like this is a is going to be a really good signing. I, I, I love him because he's such a chaotic human being and player yeah I, I just can't wait to see him play I think he's going to get 15 to 20 this year I'm not going to lie I didn't expect him to hit the ground run like he did because everyone's taking the mick out of him in pre-season and it just show, once again goes to show Liverpool not the best pre-season he didn't have the best pre-season Man United had a good pre-season and you know it's gone pretty opposite in terms of uh, Nunez scoring but you just said you expect him to start I would say he probably should start but I've seen a lot of people saying sort of you know Klopp's going to want a reaction out of this Liverpool side yeah. going into next game. He's going to want a reaction. So, is he maybe going to go with a team that he trusts and put Firmino in there because he wants to go? And then he knows from, you know, two games now that Nunez can come off the bench and make that yeah, impact. impact. So, is he maybe going to go with a team that he's going to he's been used to and then bring him on and then maybe introduce him, you know, to start in a few games down the line? I, I think Palace's be... vulnerability in the air, sorry, Kira. I think Palace's vulnerability in the air should probably lead to Nunez starting, but it wouldn't surprise me if you picked the exact same team and, and Palace are really good. So, you know, it's going to be a tough game, but I, I feel pretty confident that we will win that one. And for whether Firmino starts, he was awful on Saturday, but it is what it is. You know, he it plays have bad games game. all the time. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing. I think, like, at Anfield, most teams, you like you will sit in because you know you're not going to see the lion's share of the ball. And when you've got players in the forward line with pace and good on the counter-attack and full-backs who can bomb forward as well, um, you will sit in and maybe... Is, is the right player for that which is why if you introduce him later on in the game when fatigue is setting in there might be more spaces more opportunities for someone of his ill and someone of his qualities to take more advantage of. I mean I guess we've only seen him play once or twice and you know Palace yeah. under Vieira are a bit more expansive than they have been in previous years so they may well really take the game to Liverpool but previous years indicate that it is going to be more of a counter-attack sit in soak up pressure um, and try and hit them on the break so if that is the case maybe Oli could be right in a sense of someone like Firmino, Diaz, Jota, Salah, those players who are better at intricate yeah. spaces, breaking down teams slowly. I, mean, I think we're yet to see if Nunez can do that because at the time Fulham were very expansive and like I think just seconds before his goal he had another chance of a like in a similar fashion. So yeah, flick, there were more yeah. spaces when he came on potentially, which might not be there at the start of the Palace games. So we might struggle, but I mean, it's true. remains to be seen. Imagine how many goals he could score though if he starts a game. Like he's showing that he's he's got a finish on him. Whether yeah. it's you know, I, I prefer. I actually haven't seen the highlights of the Liverpool game, um, so I don't know what his goal. What his he's just goal, an instinctive finish. Goal was like yeah, exactly. Like, 
But I mean, that, that's that's the, the biggest takeaway from it. Like even the Community Shield goal, how he adjusted his body to get so low and head yeah. it in so comfortably, you know. And the, the finish was by no means an easy one. I think it's just the, the way he reacts to the ball coming in shows the signs of a natural finisher, like developing, growing, and maturing. So I think if he c- can, c- carries on the way he's going, I mean, 15 yeah, to 20, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, actually, yeah, I, just realized, I just realized I lied. I did see it. I watched Match of the Day. I just can't remember his goal because I can remember, <laughs> Mitch, I can remember Mitrovic's goal. Uh, it was it was not special, but it was just like his kind of instinctive finish. It, he, there's technical flaws with Nunes, clearly, by the fact that he is chaos, but. There, there's su- there's such a player there. There's a real exciting sort of base of a striker. He's got that. He's not like I'm not comparing to Haaland, but he's got that Haaland type build. He's big, tall. He's quick. And I mean Haaland. We can talk about Haaland. I mean, if there any, has there ever been a signing so guaranteed to be successful in the Premier League than Erling Haaland? I mean, we can already see that this guy yeah. is going to score so many goals for Manchester City, not just this season, but next season, the season after, and the season after that. The thing, I mean, with, the thing with Haaland, I find scary is the fact he's. He's not only so physically strong, but he's also so fast. Like I've never seen a strike. I've never seen a striker that no other. Like, and, and I'm not even afraid to say I've never seen a striker so all rounded. Like got hell of a finish. It's really strong. Got a good. Uh, I mean, he didn't didn't have great aerial threat against Liverpool, but normally is quite good aerial threat. And he's also really really fast. So I mean, this guy's. Uh, uh, I'm just I'm a Man United fan but I'm so excited to watch Man City play I always am excited to watch Man City play which is really sad to be honest but yeah On Haaland as well like I think we raised some valid concerns I think you know, of how City would have to change how they were going to play and then you literally see within their first game De Bruyne classic De Bruyne ball through and you're thinking oh you know, he's ever hit that and Haaland just gets there comfortably um, so I think you, you don't know what to do against City because you always felt like if you stayed deep, they just pick you apart. So you try and play a high line because they didn't really have many players who liked to run in behind. They had players who would like to run at you, run past you and get crosses in. Now you've got someone like Harden, but you've got people like Bernardo Silva who like go on these jinking runs. Mares, who, you know, not really renowned for his pace, more for fake shot, fake shot, jinking inside, beating his man. So you've got another weapon you can use now. And I think, I mean, Man City were terrifying before, but it seems that yeah. they've, already kind of adapted to what they wanted to do and what Haaland needs them to do. Just a little bit unfair. And also, you know, for, for the modern day uh, trans market, he's actually quite cheap due to his um his uh, release clause as well. But quickly, uh, I know we're running on a little bit here, but I just want to talk about, you've all mentioned him, Mitrovic. You've already said, you know, he scored so many goals, that 40 or whatever goals in the championship. There's no, if he can do that against, you know, what arguably one of the best defences in the world, it's not like he's just gone and done it against Bournemouth, is yeah. it? He's gone and done it against Van Dijk, you know, against that defence. So surely, you know, he's if he can do it then, he's got to be able to do it against I'm, you know any other team, really. We're sort of looking towards next week, and, I, and I'm this weekend's football, sorry, and, and I'm we're actually really intrigued to see how they get on against Wolves because that is going to be a completely different game. That is a real not relegation battle, but I mean it could be. We don't know. Wolves have obviously not had the best start, losing losing to Leeds, and they've not had the you know the the best preseason. Just and they just lost Connor Cody. I don't know if he did play, but he's a sort of a stalwart of, of Wolves of, of the Premier League era that they've had. But it's going to be interesting to see how they adjust to. There's no pressure against against Liverpool. You, it's got it's obviously it's a Premier League game. You want to win, but it, it's almost a free hit because Liverpool don't lose to a lot of teams. Wolves is a game, albeit away from home. I feel like their fans now probably expect a point at least from that game and go, well, we could beat these. And that was not an expectation before Liverpool. They were Liverpool, they were going, oh, we, you know, if this is a narrow defeat, it's cool. But now it's going, hold on, we, we can do something against Wolves here. So that three, I'm, I'm, three I'm, points. I'm really intrigued. Three points. I'm really, three points for them. I'm really intrigued to see how, how they get on against the team that they will probably, if they do finish low mid table, will be around them. So. I'm intrigued. That I'm also intrigued by by another game this weekend. I did quickly touch on this. Aston Villa Everton. Obviously, the battle of England's two midfielders. That everyone talks about Gerard and Lampard. I mean, awful start to the, to the season for Aston Villa. They look void of any creativity, which is a shame because everyone's got Leon Bailey in their team. <laughs> and what a I flop. Did that. Smart, <laughs> smart man. Neto got bonus points for me for that ridiculous roulette he did. <laughs> I worry about Villa as well. The whole, the whole, I think just to quickly touch on it, away from the pitch, the whole Ming situation is a bit of a concern. Yeah. Like when you've got that sort of thing going on in the background. Well, what's uh, going I on? Gerard say, saying, Gerard said, you, Ming's has been taken off the captaincy. I think it's been given to John McGinn. And I think he's dealing with a bit of an injury at the moment. And maybe Gerard has indicated, I think he said something along the lines of, um, when he shows me that he's ready to play, he will play. So it's like a bit, 
people yeah. like. To be fair, classic, Ming's probably isn't going to play. Room. Ming's probably isn't going to be in the starting lineup. John McGinn probably no, is. So it, really exactly, exactly. So it probably makes sense. I mean, I was people but, worrying. I, th- I think had they beaten Bournemouth, it wouldn't have been yeah. mountain out of a molehill. But I think that result just kind of solidified that, and then people start panicking and worrying, thinking we've got all these creative players. You know, what what Jacob Ramsey was one of the most exciting young players in the Premier League last season. Barely got a look in. Sign Coutinho, massive deal. Wendy and Bailey from the previous season, nothing. Two strikers who would probably go into most mid-table clubs and start. Um, good recruitment as well in, in defence of midfield, centre-back and left-back with Dinier, good keeper. Everything is there for Villa. Yeah. So when you have a result like that, it's like, yeah. is everything there? So which that, then makes, as Nathan said, this game against Everton so important. That, that's why I'm a bit nervous for Aston Villa, to be honest. I said at the start of the season, I think they can do really well, but... I don't think they can do much better. That Aston Villa, unless, you know, they start doing that West Ham and they, they really get high and then, you know, more players will be attracted to get to them. But that's going to take a while. You know, West Ham have been doing quite well for the you know, past three seasons and still they're not signing those big, big players because they are West Ham. Aston Villa, you know, they're they're spending money. They're bringing in, you know, brought Babaka Kamara or whatever, who's, a, you know, one of the best CDMs in, in Europe in the last couple of seasons. They got Coutinho, you know, who, who, did, um, who did dip down at Barcelona, but, you know, he came in doing quite well. So... They can't do much more in terms of bringing in players, which, you know, are very good signings for them. I don't think they can really go a level above because the players they're already bringing in probably, you know, could be like the back of Kamara, could be in one of the top six teams. So I don't yeah. think they can... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wanted them to get them. I don't know where I am. But... Um, so I don't really know where they can go. So I think that's actually quite worrying because they can't do much more. And I think, like you said, we said last uh, week quite a lot, you know, if in... Staying in the Premier League means you have to have someone that can score goals. And currently, no one in their team looks like they can score a goal. So, I was quite confident for have seen one, one game. Let's not get too worried. But they, they're kind of at the top of where they possibly can be. So, maybe they can be a bit nervous because they're spending all this money. And as we've seen time and time again, sometimes teams spend too much money, too many new players, and things just all go wrong. And at the minute, it, it's not a good indication for the rest of the season. It's, it's an interesting one. And just last point, really, on Villa. They, they lost Michael Beale, who is, um, was Gerard's right-hand man at, Ra- at Rangers. And also when he came into Aston Villa, was Michael Beale now took the QPR job as, as the manager. They obviously and they hired Neil Critchley, um, who was the Blackpool manager, to sort of replace him. So it'll be interesting to see how that relationship moulds itself because Michael Beale was widely credited for a lot of Gerard's success at, at Rangers. It's sort of almost what people thought uh, Klopp and Buvak's relationship was when, when he was at Liverpool, when, where he was the mind and Gerard was the leader, which probably naturally suits Gerard as, as, as such a big personality. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how, how good it, because if they lose to Everton, I, like, I don't think any manager, I don't, obviously I don't want Gerard to get sacked, but you do start worrying because you lose your first two games to Everton and Bournemouth. That's a lot different to losing your first two games to Liverpool and Man City. It's pan- it would be panic stations, I think, for Villa fans, especially with a bit of expectation this season and all the money spent as we've, We've touched upon so genuinely quite an interesting early kickoff on Saturday. Aston Villa Everton, you know, very much could be a boring the table clash next season, like at the end of this season. But right now, it's big. I think we should just leave it there. To be honest, I think we yeah. said everything. It's been going yeah. on a little bit. So um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks right, for listening. Make sure to check us out. One to football. One to football. You can check out our website. One to football.com. All the latest written articles, and we will see you in two weeks' time. <laughs>